And uh, let's pray and ask for God's uh, help and blessing as we consider his word together uh, this morning. Heavenly Father, this morning we gladly acknowledge that Jesus is our only master and Lord. We praise you, Lord Jesus, for your lordship, evident in creation, salvation, redemption. And we thank you that the way in which you rule is uh, by your word. And we thank you that all of your words, uh, Lord God, is uh, God-breathed. All of the scriptures are God-breathed. Those parts which are familiar and those parts which are less familiar. Those parts which are perhaps easy to hear and those parts which may be harder to hear. We thank you that all of your word is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the man or the woman of God may be fully equipped for every good work. And so, Father, as we come to this book of Jude this morning, as we consider just a few verses, we pray and that we might hear these words as coming from you and that they may be useful to us, useful to your people, your church here at Felton, that your Holy Spirit would take these words that he inspired to be written down by Jude all those years ago, that they might come to us with a freshness and with a power, and that you might speak to us, that you would give us ears to hear what you want us to hear this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we must act now before it's too late. If we don't act now, it will be too late. We're facing a great threat that affects us all, whether we realise it or not. And therefore, inaction is not an option. Apathy is not acceptable. Everything is not going to be just okay. There is something we need to fight for. Well, just in case you are wondering or perhaps what worrying, uh, let me quickly reassure you that you've not walked into a uh, an extinction rebellion or just stopped the oil protest service. Because although this kind of this is the kind of language uh, used by those who would warn us of the the so called climate crisis. This is actually the language, the rallying cry from the loving heart of Pastor Jude to his dear Christian friends. No doubt we've all heard scientists and politicians uh, issuing a final warning on the climate emergency. They tell us that rising greenhouse Gashes are pushing our world to the brink of irrevocable damage that only swift and drastic action can avert. They tell us to act now or it will be too late. But as we come to God's word this morning, we hear Pastor Jude issuing a more urgent call regarding an even greater threat to a more precious resource that affects us all, whether we realise it or not. And therefore he tells us inaction and apathy aren't options. Now, as, as I was reading this little book of Jude earlier, perhaps you were thinking to yourself, what on earth is that all about? I was walking in uh, Teddington High Street on uh, Friday and I noticed a shop called Jude the Obscure. And uh, for many of us, perhaps this little book of Jude is, is just frankly obscure. It's got these lots of references to the Old Testament, the bits of uh, writings that aren't in the Bible, the book of Enoch. 
What on earth is this all about? But thankfully, Jude tells us exactly what his little book is all about. Do you see verse 3? Have a look at your Bibles, verse 3. He writes and he says, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. So Jews says that he had originally planned to write an uplifting and encouraging uh, letter all about our common salvation. But then he had heard of a great threat to this church regarding a, pre a precious deposit. And so he writes this letter instead as an urgent call for his hearers to contend, to act now before it's too late. That word contend we see here means to struggle. It means to fight. It means to expend energy and effort in taking action. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know how you react when you hear these warnings about this climate crisis, this climate emergency. I don't know how you respond when you see these eco-warriors gluing themselves to roads and chaining themselves to goalposts and getting so hot and bothered about the climate, which they say is getting hot and bothered. Um, I, my reaction, rightly or wrongly, probably wrongly, but my reaction is just to sort of shrug my shoulders and say, whatever. Uh, you know, I'm not that bothered. You know, each to their own in that. If you want to go and do that, fine. But, but I've got more important, more pressing things to worry about. Not really my problem. But you see here, in writing this letter, Jude says, no, there is something that is worth fighting for. There is something that is worth being bothered about. There is something that we can't just have a kind of not my problem attitude towards as the church of Jesus Christ. And in his book, Jude lays out what it is that his hearers must contend for. He explains why they must contend for it. And then he outlines how they are to contend for it. We're just going to look at verses one to four this morning and perhaps... I'll have an opportunity to come back another time and we'll look through the rest of this letter another time. But with Jude's big aim of contending, contending for the faith in mind, let's look at verses one to four together. And let's notice firstly that we have a great salvation. We have a great salvation. Just because Jude didn't get to write a whole letter about our common salvation doesn't mean that our salvation isn't mentioned in his letter. In fact, even in the way he addresses his, his hearers in verse 1, we're given a window into the greatness of our salvation. He writes, verse 1, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. And here we see something of the past, the present, and the future aspects of our great salvation. Believers, Christians, those who have turned from their sins and turned to Jesus as Lord, as we were just been singing, they are those who have been called by God to belong to him, Unlike when you're uh, choosing teams, perhaps when you was a kid or you're down the park or you're in, you're in the playground and you choose teams and you choose those who are the best, the most skillful, the brightest, the biggest. But in contrast, the Bible says that it's the other way around with God. That God calls us to himself, not because we're the best or the brightest or the biggest. Rather, we're often the weakest. The weediest, the worst. Do you remember what Moses said to the people of Israel as to the as to why the Lord 
chose them. Just hear these words from Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy 7 verse 6. Moses says, for you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. For you were the fewest of all the peoples. But it's because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And what, God, what caused God to, to set his affection on you this morning? What, God, what caused God to choose you? You're a believer this morning. Well, the answer is not because of anything worthy, not because of anything deserving, not because of anything special about you or about me, but simply because of his gracious, sovereign choice. And therefore, because our choosing to belong to God is, is as Paul puts it in Ephesians 2, it's not our own doing. Rather, it's the gift of God not a result of works, then it leaves no room for, for us to be self-righteous, for us to have a sort of holier-than-now, better-than-you attitude. Rather, we humbly and gratefully give thanks. We boast in God, in our God who graciously chooses. And then those who have been called by God in the past can rest assured that they are as as Jude puts it, beloved in God the Father in the present. Beloved in God the Father. It was reported on the BBC News and just this week that a US real estate billionaire uh, and a deep sea explorer are planning to travel um, in, a, in a submersible to explore the Titanic. Uh, about 4,000 uh, miles under the under at the bottom of the North Atlantic Ocean, and that's despite that tragedy we saw uh, last year of that Titan submersible, and which became unreachable in those depths of the ocean, and those five people tragically died. Well, it's that same imagery of, of being submerged, that same imagery of being enclosed. That Jude uses here. But in this case, it's not the life-taking depths of the ocean which we're surrounded by, but it's the life-giving, life, life-saving love of the Father that Jude says is right now every believer is surrounded by, enclosed in, beloved in God the Father. Again, just listen to what Paul writes in Romans 8 about the love that God has for us in the Lord Jesus. He says in Romans 8 verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword as it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Now in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Paul says, for I am sure, I'm convinced that nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God that's in 
Christ Jesus. I wonder if you're sure this morning. I wonder if you are convinced that nothing in all of creation, nothing that you're going through right now will be able to separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. The love of God that's not dependent upon our feelings or our circumstances. The love of God that's been demonstrated in the giving of the Lord Jesus to die for our sins. The objective truth of the gospel where God didn't spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, gave him up to be, to be plunged into those depths of darkness and judgment on the cross, in my place and in your place, in order that we who are undeserving may be enclosed in the love of the Father. Christians are those who have been called by God in the past, are loved in God the Father in the present and, kept, and, are, and can be reassured that they are kept, as Jude puts it, for Jesus Christ in the future. I don't know if you've ever been to um, the Tower of London. It's just down the road from where we live. And uh, you go to the Tower of London and I'd, I'd Maybe it's just the way my brain works, but I can't help just thinking, how how would you go about trying to nick some of these <laughs> nick some of these jewels? And you think it's impossible, locked up, impenetrable, in the vault, in the Tower of London. And it's that same kind of imagery that the Christian is kept by God's power in Christ and for Christ until that day when he returns and we live with him forever. Nothing can break us out. Jesus said, no one can snatch them out of my hands. And Jude wanted to re reassure his hearers then, just as he wants to reassure his hearers now. That despite the dangers and the threats that they were facing, and that we may face, they can be reassured that God will keep a firm grip on his people. That despite what the hymn writer calls fightings within and fears without, despite our conflicts and fears and temptations and struggles and weaknesses and sins, we can take comfort this morning that we are kept for Jesus Christ. Peter puts it this way, that we are being shielded by God's power, not our power, but by God's power, until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. We sing in the hymn, Amazing Grace, through many dangers, toils and snares, I have already come. His grace has brought me safe thus far. And grace will lead me home. It's not like grace brings us so far and then we carry on in our own strength. No, it's God's grace. God's keeping grace. That keeps us up till now and tomorrow and the next day. Until all of them days that God has written in his book. Until we're led home. And in the meantime, as we wait for that day when we'll be led home. Jude says we get to experience in the here and now, verse 2, mercy, peace, and love in abundance. This is what's now available to us to be our constant companions as we journey on through those dangers, toils, and snares. That mercy, new every morning, that peace that passes all understanding, that boundless love of God in the Lord Jesus. As we'll see, and as Jude sets out in his letter, he goes on to issue sober warnings 
to his dear friends. But as he does so, and before he does so, he wants them and he wants us in turn to know the firm foundation on which we stand. That of being called, loved and kept. And he wants us to know that this great salvation is worth not only singing about, as we've already done so this morning, but it's also worth safeguarding. It's worth protecting, preserving, contending for. And Jude now goes on to tell his hearers why all this contending is necessary. And so let's notice, secondly, that we are facing a great threat. We're facing a great threat. If I were to ask you what the, 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 the biggest threats to the church and to the Christian faith are today, I wonder what you would say. Perhaps the fierce persecution of Christians around the world. You know, will the church of Christ survive when churches are being burnt down? When Christians are being persecuted and their homes burnt and even killed for the sake of Christ. Or we think a bit closer to home and there's been a, a recent uh, government uh, proposal uh, to ban uh, what's called sort of uh, so-called conversion therapy. Will the church survive when simply preaching what the Bible teaches about sex and gender and marriage runs the risk of being criminalised? We'll look down at verse 3 with me and listen to Jude as he tells his hearers what this great threat to the church is and where it's coming from. He says, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation. Ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Jesus says that the great threat they were facing wasn't external, wasn't coming from outside the church, rather it's internal. It's coming from right inside the church. And that's what made the threat all the more dangerous. He says, for certain people have crept in unnoticed. Now I've got this um I've got this Rolex watch here. Um, but I'm minded to think it's probably not the real deal. Uh, and I think that partly because instead of paying about 30 grand for it, which is the sort of going rate for one of these, um, I only paid about 30 quid for it in a night market in Malaysia about 20 years ago. But the real clincher for me, the real reason why I'm pretty convinced that it's not a kosher Rolex watch is because when I bought it, I noticed it had a sticker on the inside that spelt the word genuine incorrectly <laughs> i kind of thought go oh, you know you don't have to make it that obvious um, but you see unlike my fake rolex watch jew says it won't be so easy to spot fakes within the church false teachers then and false teachers today don't walk into the church with false teacher or heretic or phony stamped across their foreheads. No Jew says they, they creep in unnoticed. They slip in under the radar. They talk the gospel talk. They have an appearance of, of godliness. But Jude says, in fact, they are ungodly people. And so Jude wants his hearers to wake up to this clear and present danger right within their midst. A danger which supposedly had taken them by surprise. But notice he says here, they hadn't taken God by surprise. 
He says, these people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation. Ungodly people. And the scriptures are littered with examples of and warnings about false teachers. People who are going to come in and destroy the flock and draw disciples away, causing them to make a shipwreck of their faith. And here's how they're going to do it. You see verse 4. He says, by perverting the grace of our God into sensuality and denying our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. These people who had crept in were such a great threat because they were attacking the very foundations of the Christian faith, namely the grace of God and the Lordship of Christ. They take the precious grace of God, the grace by which we're called and loved and kept, and they twist it, they pervert it, they distort it into sensuality, or as the NIV puts it, into a license for immorality. Um, I passed my driving test. We were chatting just, just before the service with the chap who's passed his driving test just yesterday. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. And uh, he passed first time, and I passed second time, unfortunately. And I got my license about 18 or so years ago. And I don't know if you passed your driver's license, if you remember that far back or, or recently. But I remember my overwhelming feeling when the examiner said to me, and he turned to me and he said, you've passed. And my feeling was relief and freedom. Freedom. I'm no longer tied down by those L plates. We can, we can rip up their L plates, as, as Kane was saying. I'm no longer obliged to follow my instructor's instructions. I'm now free to drive however I want, as long as I don't get caught. Whenever I want, with whomever I want. For as long as I want, I've got the license. I'm free. And you see, there's certain people, Jude says, who have crept into the church and they were saying the grace of God gives you a pass. It gives you a license to do whatever and live however you want. They were saying perhaps one to one. You can throw off the L plates of God's law. You're no longer obliged to follow your master and Lord's instructions anymore. You're under grace. It's okay. We see this today in, in books. There's a book called Love Wins by a chap called Rob Bell. And he goes on to say, well, it doesn't really matter how you live because in the end, love wins. God's love will win through. And then, of course, last year, the, the Church of England voted to bless uh, same-sex marriages in complete contradiction to God's word. And the Bishop of London, a lady called Sarah Mullerly, she said this. She said, we wanted to create a space where we could just about touch each other, understanding each other, and embracing radical Christian inclusion. Some may call it love wins. Well, others will call it embracing radical Christian inclusion. But you see what Jude calls it? He calls it a perversion of the grace of our God and a denial of our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and, you know, just in case we're tempted to think, well, that's not happening here. That's out there. That's not my denomination. That's not our church. Well, let me ask you, aren't there times and ways in which you, in which we have acted, in which we pervert, in which we twist the grace of God into sensuality, into giving us a license, a pass, <laughs> for living and acting how we want? Do we indulge in immorality, knowing that we'll just run back to God and ask for forgiveness later? 
is twisting God's grace. It's denying Christ's lordship. Do we sing Jesus as Lord as we've done so this morning? But then have areas of our lives that are no-go areas. We we'll say, you can't touch that area. My finances, my desires, my plans, my free time, my sexuality, my Monday to Saturday, whatever it might be. See, God's grace liberates us from sin, but not for sin. Rather, it liberates us for a life lived under the lordship of Jesus Christ. These infiltrators were attacking the very foundations of the Christian faith, the gospel of grace and the lordship of Christ. And the Jew says if these false teachers were left unchecked, then irrevocable damage would be inflicted upon local churches and individual believers. If the objective body of gospel truth was not contended for, then these infiltrators would destroy the flock and believers would be in danger. And so he says, yes, we have a great salvation, but we're facing a great threat. And therefore, thirdly and lastly, he says we must enter a great struggle. We come back to Jude's aim, Jude's big aim. The whole reason he wrote this little letter in the first place, in verse 3, he writes, appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. When Jude writes about the faith, he's not talking about my personal faith or your personal faith. He's not talking about something that's subjective. Rather, he's talking about the objective body of Christian truth. Through which we come to know the Lord and around which every local church including this one is built upon and gathered around when Jesus was speaking to his disciples at the last supper he said in John 16 he said I've, I still have many things to say to you but you cannot bear them now but when the spirit of truth comes he will guide you into all the truth Jesus promised that the coming spirit would guide the apostles into all truth. And by the time Jude wrote this letter about AD 60, there was already an established body of Christian truth. An established, an established gospel truth. I recently got an alert on my phone uh, to tell me that there'll be a, a software update overnight. Technology is constantly being updated, upgraded. But Jude tells us that despite what these false teachers are telling you, there's no such thing as a, a, a scriptural update. Yes, the gospel message must be proclaimed in a way that's relevant, you could say, in a way that's going to be understood. Yes, you might need to use different language to connect with different people from different cultures and different ages. But the gospel message itself must remain unchanged. Mm -hmm. And so in the light of these infiltrators who were saying then, and who are still saying today, oh, we, we've received a new update on God's truth, which they then use as an excuse to pervert God's grace and deny Jesus' lordship. Jude said no. The objective gospel truth has once for all. That is signed and sealed and delivered. And is not subject to change. And notice that this, this, this body of gospel truth. He says has once for all been delivered to the saints, not simply to the church leaders or to church elders, but to the saints, to all God's people, to you and I, if we're believers here this morning. 
And therefore, it's all of our responsibility to contend for it, which not only means proclaiming it, but also protecting it. And Jude will go on to tell his hearers exactly how they are to practically contend for the faith. But suffice to say that the weapons that we are to fight with aren't the weapons of this world. Rather, we're to use the weapons, as he'll go on to say, of God's word and of prayer and of faith. We contend by keeping ourselves from being drawn away by false teaching and false ideas. We contend as we show mercy to others who are in danger of being led astray, as we reach out to them. And we contend, as Jude will go on to say, ultimately, as we continue to fix our eyes on God our Saviour, the one who is able to keep us from stumbling and being led astray. But for now we hear this, this more urgent call than the call over the climate crisis, the call to contend for the faith. It contains a more precious resource than, than even the environment God has made. The objective body of gospel truth contained here in the Bible, which reveals our great salvation. It's regarding an even greater threat than the, the threat of rising greenhouse gases. The threat to the very foundations of, the, of our faith, the gospel of God and the lordship of Christ. You know, we're often being told that we must protect the environment for our sons and daughters and coming generations. What Jude warns us here is that if the message of God's grace, if the authority of Jesus, our master and Lord, if, if that's left unprotected, uncontended for, then there'll be no saving message to pass on to the next generation. Over these summer months, perhaps you'll be watching sporting events like the Euros football tournament or, or, or uh, Wimbledon tennis or the Olympics. And in all these competitions, we'll see men and women contending actively, vigorously, energetically striving and struggling to win the prize. And in the same way, Jude, Jude writes to encourage his hearers to, to get off the sidelines, not being active or indifferent or passive about their faith, but rather on the basis of their great salvation, to be actively contending to protect and preserve the purity of the gospel in the light of the great threat they face. And may God help us here. May God help you here at Felton to heed Jude's call to contend for the faith. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Father, we thank and praise you for our great salvation. Thank you for how you graciously choose us, even before the creation of the world, to belong to you. Not because of anything good that you see in us, but simply because of your gracious, uh, sovereign choice. Thank you so much that nothing in all creation even our own sin and failings can separate us from your love in the Lord Jesus. Thank you for your wonderful promise that we are kept in and through and for Jesus Christ, despite how weak 
we may be despite our how weak we may feel. Thank you for the keeping, your keeping power and grace. And Father, please help us as your people, as your church this morning, to heed and hear this urgent call from Jude, written all those years ago, but coming to us as your living and active word did to us this morning. Help us to contend for the faith. Yes, to proclaim, but also to protect as we keep ourselves in your love, as we watch over our own hearts, as we look out for others, ultimately as we continue to fix our eyes on you, the one who's able to keep us from stumbling and falling. And I pray your blessing upon uh, the work and the life of your church here. Bless Philip, bless all those who are your people here as they continue to seek to live for you and speak for you. Pray for your protection. I pray for your blessing upon your people and your work here. Pray that all these things for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.